It's always wonderful to have uh, Professor Justin Jackson of Hillsdale College on this program. This is uh, his third appearance on the show. Um, I believe in our first meeting, we discussed the book of Genesis. In our second, we discussed the story of King David. And now we are uh, talking about the book of Exodus uh, leading up to Easter and, of course, the Jewish holiday of Purim. Um, Justin, welcome to the show once again. Pleasure to have always, you. Always great to be here. It's always a joy. Okay. So uh, you mentioned before um, we began recording that uh, Easter is going to come quite late for you guys in uh, North America. Uh, not in North America. Uh, in in the Orthodox Church, we have oh, slightly okay. different. Right. We have a slightly different calendar than the West does. Um, okay. yes. And yes. this this year, it's and I won't go into all of the calendar reasons for it. But this year, it's as far separated as it can be. We're I think five weeks behind you guys. So so our Pascha isn't until gosh I think May fifth. This is actually our this is our first week of Lent clean week. So okay. um, so. I hope you've had a joyous uh, Lent uh, thus far, and and I hope you have a blessed Easter. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it's been a transformative Lent season for the uh, the Western Christians, the Catholics, and I suppose the uh, various Protestant sects out there. So, um, but um, I, I didn't make it out that you are uh, part of the Eastern Church. So um, I think if you may um, tell us more about that. Oh, um, yeah. Um... There's not much to tell. Uh, Eastern Orthodox, uh, baptized in the uh, Greek Orthodox Church here in the Midwest. I go to a Orthodox Church of America. Mm -hmm. um, I am a I'm a deacon in the church, um, uh, and so uh, this is a this is a pretty busy time of the year for me because we have lots of services. This week we have um, we have services every night of the week. Uh, last night we celebrated. Um, uh, uh, pre-sanctified liturgy, canon of Saint Andrew. So, um, I'm, I will just say it's a it's a good tired. Uh, as you know, uh, Lent is a good time for us to kind of get our souls straight and kind of beat up on ourselves and knock the rust off a little bit, as it were. Yes, of course. Um, I I live in uh, Budapest, Hungary now, and currently I have uh, at least two friends who are of the Eastern uh, Christian tradition. One is. Okay. Uh, a member of the Russian Orthodox Church, although he's American, and the other is uh, of the Greek Church. And okay. one, one more thing I should mention is that, um, so those of us who are watching by video, I, I think um, I should really kick myself for not figuring out you're being off Orthodox, because you really resemble uh, one Fyodor Dostoevsky. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'll take that as a compliment. The president of our college likes to... Uh, likes to uh, remind everybody that I look a little bit more like Rasputin. So I'll take <laughs> Dostoevsky any day of the week. <laughs> so um, how does um, the Orthodox Easter celebration differ from that of the uh, Western Christian tradition? I, I couldn't tell you. I've never been. <laughs> oh. I, I, I've, I've only been to Orthodox. I've never been to another Easter service in my mm -hmm in my life so i've only celebrated orthodox uh pasca but I, I i assume so um it's probably very similar to uh, this would be obvious probably very similar to uh byzantine catholics because they celebrate the liturgy of saint john chrysostom so that's our liturgy that we celebrate so um I, i'm pretty ignorant of norvis ordo uh easter celebrations i have no idea okay so um just to let you know this uh this interview of ours uh, would come out during the uh, Western Christian Easter celebration. So a couple oh, of wonderful. weeks from now. Well, so, that's um, great. Well, I mean, it's timely then, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. it, I keep saying Pascha and I try to, I try to, I try to be disciplined to say Easter, but Pascha is just simply uh, the Greek uh, word for, uh, for Passover, uh, for, for Pesca um, in, in, in Hebrew. So. That's it. Okay. So uh, let's move on to uh, your substack which uh, is uh, a new creation of yeah. yours. Uh, I believe um, sometime between uh, our previous conversation and this one, you've uh, expressed to me uh, in private your intentions to launch one. So congratulations yeah. on uh, finally getting that off the ground. The yeah. Substack uh, publication is titled, How Do You Read It? And I'll give the floor to you to describe what that is. Yeah, so it's how do you read it? I think the I think the address is bibleandliterature.substack.com. 
Um, a friend, a, a friend of mine, uh, I approached him because he's very good with video. He's very good with editing. And I know nothing about those things. If I had to do it, I'd probably just have an iPhone, <laughs> put it in front of me and, and film. But he's he's excellent with that stuff. So, um, you know, I've been, gosh, I've been doing these online courses for the college for a number of years now. And I, I really get inundated with lots and lots of questions. People are interested in kind of pursuing these things. So I thought, why not just give myself a, a venue to be able to just go slowly through Genesis, all of those things I didn't get to cover in the course. Some of the things I did cover in the course, but to cover again, um, occasionally, you know, I'll read, um, I'll read some theological poetry that will be commentary, for example, on Genesis. So Saint Ephraim the Syrian, for example, is hymns on paradise. Uh, I've I've done done a little bit with that, and, and so it's just a way for it's just a way for me to oh I don't know just kind of share these brief ideas snippets, but to go all the way through the book of Genesis and um, I work through it in a literary fashion. So it's meant to be a supplement to the online courses. Um, I suppose I feel a little more a little more freedom to be theological because the online courses, we want to keep that open for everybody and whatnot. But still, I really do try to abide by keeping it as a study of the Hebrew Bible, not as the Old Testament per se. The Hebrew Bible, um, I still work with lots of rabbinic commentary, lots of ancient Christian exegesis, still work quite a bit with Girardian analysis. In fact, I can just explicitly now just kind of give some lessons on what uh, Gerard is up to and everything like that. So after we're done with Genesis, um, uh, we haven't really talked yet where we're going next. Uh, we're just we're just getting through the Jacob and Esau story. So I still have I still have quite a ways to go. Um, but we try to give them in uh, kind of digestible uh, um, videos. So you know it's been my experience when I watch something. A lot of these. Um, Kind of lectures will go on for two and a half hours and I just I don't have time for two and a half hours so we try to stay very very disciplined by keeping each one of these lessons or lectures between uh 15 and 20 minutes and I just do it right here in my office where I'm sitting right now uh so it's it's a lot of fun for me uh, I, I I enjoy it and I and the beauty of it is you know reading biblical literature it's just kind of inexhaustible mystery for me uh, I, I just stumble over things uh, every single time I prepare for a lecture, it, it's really, it's, it's wonderful, very edifying for me uh, as, as well. I see. Well, uh, I encourage everybody to check out your Substack. Again, it is, how do you read it? Question mark. Um, so a, a side question, uh, what translation of the Bible do you use for these lectures? Yeah, so the lectures, I, I use the same one that I use for the online courses, and that's Robert Alter's um, uh, translation, whom, whom you have uh, right. you've interviewed. Um, I use it for a, a couple of reasons, really. One, it's magnificent. It's an incredible translation. But two, I mean, Alter's kind of, I, I take him as the foremost expert uh, in the world with regards to biblical literature, biblical narrative, biblical poetry, and his footnotes are incredible. Um, he really brings out the poetic qualities of the narrative, and it just makes it so much easier to teach when you have someone who's conscious of all of the poetic and narrative techniques that the authors are employing to then work those into his translation. Um, and so uh, th that's the one that I use. I'll make reference every once in a while. Another translation I love is Everett Fox's. So every once in a while, I'll, I'll throw something out there from Fox's translation uh, is as well. Um, I also like it because it's it makes everything unfamiliar for people so that we can come to the Hebrew Bible anew uh, and be ready to be surprised by things. So, you know, if I'm using the King James Version, which I find beautiful, but if I'm using it, everyone's familiar with it. We're just used to the language that it uses. And this one here kind of will take you aback in a, in a few in a few different places. Um, it's if I don't know if you've read David Bentley Hart's New Testament. Um, uh, but it has the same effect as is is alters uh, um, Hebrew Bible is that he's just translating things anew and sometimes when you're not used to seeing that it's it catches your you know it, it catches your eyes and even then you know I can I can get through it in the Greek I suppose well enough um, but but I don't catch any of the stuff that Hart will catch and I can 
I can muddle through the biblical Hebrew, but I don't I don't catch any of the stuff that Alter gets. And so so I really love it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Alter is a, such a wonderful scholar. And it, it was oh, yeah. a privilege of mine to have met him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me about the influence of uh, one Rene Girard in your readings of uh, biblical texts. Yeah, so as I as I told you last time, um, a student, one of his one of his first grad graduate students, um, was a professor of mine at Purdue University, um, and so I got to know Gerard's work through uh, Sander Goodhart, um, uh, a really beautiful man, a uh, wonderful teacher, incredible mentor, um, and I learned that he learned how to be a, a a great teacher and a mentor. I learned that very quickly that he got it from Rene, so I got to know Rene as well. Um, um, you know, kind of learn at his feet simultaneously. And they really live out kind of this, what would I say, a, a life of charity, a life of they're not going to be, you know, in academia, uh, it, it's so unimportant that it becomes the most important thing in this world. Uh, and so academics can just, you know, uh, I, we think that everything's at stake because there's very little at stake. So rivalry just abounds here. And so to have two great mentors like that, especially Sandy, um, uh, was wonderful. They really kind of modeled for me uh, how to interact with my own students, which is you, you want them, uh, you want them to go above and beyond, you know, where you've been. You don't mind if they disagree with your readings. They, you don't mind if they correct you. In fact, you hope that they correct you. So, so yes. Yeah, so in some ways it's personal for me because, you know, it, it's kind of, what would I say? It's the marker of, of these long relationships that I had, but two, I think it's a very, I think it's a very profound hermeneutic that is a uh, uh, mimetic theory, uh, very profound. And so we find it, uh, uh, Girard began, uh, he actually has a PhD in history and he began really as a literary critic. His first, uh, his first book was on deceit, desire. it's called Deceit, Desire in the Novel, where he would study uh, authors like Stendhal, um, uh, Dostoevsky, Cervantes, Dante, uh, and so being a literary scholar, I fell in love with that book immediately. And, and the power of his analysis was, uh, I, I remember it was pretty electric to start reading these things. Uh, and, and you could tell he had learned from all of these authors, which is what he always admits, that he didn't invent mimetic theory. He's just reading, he's just reading the masters, Flaubert uh, as well. Shakespeare, he has a whole book, Theater of Envy on Shakespeare. So his argument is that he's not inventing anything. He's just looking what these authors uh, are, are up to. So eventually he went from the literary um, to the anthropological. Uh, and so he wanted to start reading mythological texts, Greek myth, world myth, uh, whatever the case may be. So he has the violence and the sacred, uh, eventually goes to the scapegoat. Um, but when he was writing Deceit, Desire in the novel, he himself, he was you know born and raised Catholic and kind of fell away from the church. Uh, but as he was writing Deceit Desire in the novel, especially the last chapter that, uh, called Dostoevsky and Apocalypse, uh, he refound his Catholic faith and, and he came back to the church. In fact, his the second book that he wrote is called Resurrection from the Underground. Um, it's a really it's just a small book, very beautiful. Um, uh, and so eventually he makes his way to the Gospels and to the uh, and to the the Hebrew Bible. Um, uh, my own mentor, Sander, uh, he's Jewish. And so he had all sorts of um, uh, wonderful insights. I learned I learned rabbinic commentary from him. I learned how to read the Hebrew Bible from him. Um, and it was nice because, you know, as Christians, we call it the Old Testament. Uh, we, we usually are going to read it through a Christological lens. Or, you know, if you're not uh, if you don't do high church things, maybe you read it in terms of kind of a covenantal relationship and kind of the evolution of that covenantal relationship ending in Christ. So it was really beautiful to work with with Sandy um, um, because he didn't he didn't have that baggage. And, and it was always just a fruitful dialogue, this sort of scriptural reasoning uh, to go through these things with him. So um, a, a Girard, a mimetic theory, I think probably the the, the the easiest condensed way to do it would be uh, the story of the wisdom of Solomon and the two women who state claim to a single child uh, when one of them uh, it, 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 uh, it killed one of her uh, had killed the child and they try to take the other one. And so Solomon's wisdom and each one claims that child is mine, that child is mine. 
So we think that their fight is over the object, the child. And so the wisdom of Solomon, uh, Rene argues, is actually, it's an unveiling of that, of that mimetic desire of that rivalry based on mimesis that um, essentially what it says is we don't desire objects primarily. We have these people we admire, our models, and we desire what they desire. We want to have what they want to have. We want to be what they are. And so in his reading of the wisdom of Solomon, you know, Solomon's solution to it is, well, I'll take the baby and I'll cut it in half. So it'll be equal. Each of you can have equal parts of this object that you seem to desire. Um, and uh, one of the women says, no, she can have it. And then, of course, he declares that one's clearly the mother. And which, by the way, the text doesn't make it clear that she's actually the biological mother. We have no idea about that. The wisdom of Solomon is to say this woman could unbind herself from whatever this rivalry is that she's in for the good of the child. So the child need not be killed or sacrificed in this way. And so she's clearly the mother of the child here. So, so that's just a snapshot. But but I find, um, um, you know, mimetic theory is very a powerful hermeneutic when going through uh, uh, the Hebrew Bible and especially the New Testament for Gerard. Uh, uh, Christ on the cross really is the complete revelation of mimetic desire, which leads to um, uh, which leads to kind of sacrifice, uh, uh, and and so I don't want to get into all of that, but um, but yeah, it's a very it's a very um, powerful uh, way to read to read scripture. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, um, I understand that in our previous conversations, including this one, we've uh, traveled through the different books of the. Hebrew Bible, or what uh, we Christians call the Old Testament, and um, you know, as we, you know, ever since I began this uh, series of dialogues uh, with you, uh, I've been consciously trying to understand what um, the Bible before Jesus is like. How how can I understand it? Um, and before rereading the book of exodus which i'm doing right now i read the book of judges which is uh, just unbelievable yeah. in yeah, yeah. it's terrible and did you read that did you read that in alter's translation um i i would love to but uh i i read it in uh, my king james okay alter's translation is just magnificent oh it's just it's it's great so sorry i interrupted you yeah. okay but yeah I, I should check that out but um I I think uh, many um, Christians and non-Christians often think of uh, the Old Testament God as one of um, violence and vengeance, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't read it that way. The, the violence and the vengeance do not come from God. They come from the people, yes. the, the humans. And, yes. and um, But one thing that I'm still trying to uh, grapple with is that um, how is the God of the the Hebrews or the God of the Old Testament, the same as the God of the New Testament, i.e., Jesus. How do I square these two entities, um, knowing that they are of one? So, I'd like to ask uh, guess, your process in doing so. Yeah, I, I guess I'd have to ask you, um, what is it that you're trying to square? What is it that you think the God of the Old Testament? How is he different from the God of the New Testament? Well, um, for one, um. He's not human, the the God of the Old Testament. Um, he has not adopted human form, so I see. Um, he has yeah. not, um, I guess, witnessed or seen the world through the eyes of humans, and and for that he he is, uh, you know, he strikes me at least as more powerful, but at the same time, much much more distant. Okay, so 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 I'll answer that. And, and I'll try to kind of focus on some of the things that I brought up in the Exodus course at, at Hillsdale. So one of the things I would say is, is I think, I think the life of Moses and his interaction with God kind of undercuts what you're saying there. Because in fact, in fact, Moses in, at Sinai um, um, gets to see God's backside. God says, no, no one can see my face and live. Uh, uh, Saint John the theologian, uh, the, uh, the the writer of the the the, the Gospel of John, um, he even says no one has seen God. In fact, Saint John makes sure that we understand that that uh, Christ is the icon, the the image uh, in Greek, icon. Um, uh, he's the image of God. 
So if he's the image of God, then when you see Christ, you're actually seeing God the Father of, of the Old Testament. So um, um, Moses, when he's on Sinai, he gets to see God's backside, which isn't seeing God's face, but he's seeing God. That is, in fact, God. That is the kavod of God. He's seeing the glory of God, not, not some intermediary that's there with God. He sees God. Um, so, so that would be the first thing. The second thing I would I would have you pay attention to is that they're they're so close to one another, um, um, in speaking with one another, that when Moses comes down off of Sinai to the people, he's glowing, and I take this that he's glowing with the glory. Oh, I said the kavod of God. The kavod of God is the glory of God, that which is around God, which is in some ways, uh, uh, uh. Uh, God Himself and His in His in His attributes as He comes to us, so Moses comes down, His face aglow with the kavod of God, and it's it's so powerful. If you remember, that the people uh, He has to put a veil over His face in order to speak with the people, and I think what we're supposed to understand by this is that Moses Himself is standing there as if He were the holy of holies. In the Holy of Holies in the temple, of course, is precisely the place where God is, where the high priest goes into once a year. But Moses is that Holy of Holies. He's veiled, which then means what? God is present there in, in Moses. So so in some ways, I hope you see how I think in some ways this idea of a distant God who isn't there, who doesn't listen, um, who's only wrathful, who only punishes. I, I'll be honest, I just I don't see... I just don't see that in in the in the Hebrew Bible. And again, you know, I I guess I guess all of my training with Sander just kind of um, what would I say, um, kind of helped me to see that that just simply wasn't uh, the case. Uh, you know, uh, it also helps in orthodoxy. That's it's not a tremendous amount that that one is focusing on uh, in the Old Testament either. So things that Sandy would teach me about, you know. Uh, the first, you know, uh, the rabbis will teach you God has a thousand faces, but his dominant face is the God of mercy, Hashem, um, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 6, which is quoted all throughout the Hebrew Bible. This God is long-suffering, compassionate, merciful, right? And this was Jonah's complaint to God in chapter 4. He said, whenever God, he's, God spares the Ninevites when they repent. I mean, this is this is stunning. And, and then Jonah says, I knew you were going to spare them because you're long suffering, merciful and compassionate. So it seems to me that that's actually the key attribute. Uh, that's the key attribute of God that, that in some way, shape or form, we seem to have missed that. And that's one of the things I actually try to bring out in the course at, uh, at the college here um, is if Exodus is a penitential narrative, and I think it is, I think all of I think all of Scripture is about exile and return because that marks out the history of Israel, but not just history's uh, uh, Israel's history. It's our history. You know, when we live here on Earth, we're in exile. Well, what do we hope to return to? We we hope to return to God, and in fact, uh, uh, at the second coming, God will return to us. So it's always one of exile and return. Well, if you're going to have exile and return, then God must be long suffering, patient. Um, um, and compassionate. If every time we transgressed, he just wiped us out, well, the world couldn't exist. I, I think sometimes, I think sometimes Christians come to scripture with a sense of, of kind of human justice. Um, um, you get what you deserve, which I think in a nutshell is what we think of as justice. So, you know, uh, if Israel does wrong, or if, if, uh, 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 their enemies do wrong. He just he just wipes them out, uh, uh, and and I think I think one I think Scripture pushes back, and I certainly know that the commentary tradition uh, certainly pushes back against that as as well. Mm -hmm. Now, on to the Book of Exodus, um, and of course, I would encourage everyone to check out your course on uh, on the text, which is uh, available for free at the Hillsdale website. Um, one of the things that really fascinates me is that, well, Moses has a brother, Aaron, and there's not much um, about the early life of Aaron in the text, but I can only assume that Aaron lived his entire life as um, an Israelite, so he knew God from the beginning. This is not like Moses uh, due to the, um, 
the mercy accorded to him by uh, Pharaoh's his daughter. He lived for 70 odd years of his life as an Egyptian. So he only recognized his uh, Israelite heritage uh, mm -hmm. later in life. But God selected Moses as the leader of uh, this uh, long suffering population. I wonder how how much Aaron had felt you know, um, when <laughs> when um, God saw Moses as perhaps a more worthy of leadership than he is. Yeah, you know, I I really don't know. And it's not even, I mean, it's worse than that, right? It's not even, so, you know, th this is the Girardi and me kicking. I've actually really never thought about this uh, question before, their relationship. Uh, God makes it very clear that God says to Moses, you're going to be a God to Aaron and Aaron will be your prophet. Whenever Moses says, I, how am I to talk? I, I can't speak. I'm not a man of words. And then, and it's really funny in that one scene when he says, I can't do this, God, like, leave me alone. I I'm no man for doing this. And then it said, and God's wrath flared up against Moses and you're waiting. So if we're waiting for what you were just talking about, this God of wrath, who's going to have at him, then we have to wait for Moses. Okay. How is he going to punish him? But he doesn't. It turns out God gives in. He gives him Aaron. Right. Um, and so your question about, you know, how does Aaron deal with it? I don't know other than he just deals with it. There's there's not that there's not that in explanation in scripture in the in the oral tradition, uh, uh, there's a, some you know there's some indication of what their relationship was, but in scripture itself, there isn't anything there. And I, I I kind of love that because if you want rivalry, there's the rivalry for you. If God tells Moses you're going to be a god to Aaron, well you know if I'm Aaron, I'm thinking well why is this guy God? He can't even speak. He can't even speak properly. Why is he the one? Uh, who's who's in charge here? But that's that's great. I've never actually I've never really thought about Aaron and what his what his reaction would be to Moses. And, it, and it's fascinating because if if we go back to Genesis, we know that one of the major motifs there uh, is the strain of primogeniture, uh, the the elder brother versus the younger brother, um, um, and the way in which there's rivalry throughout. Beginning with Cain, I mean, the first brothers, Cain and Abel. Uh, it's it's elder brother versus younger brother, and it just keeps going. Uh, it just keeps going throughout Isaac and Ishmael, um, um, uh, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and all of his brothers, all of his brothers and Benjamin. Uh, so we see it throughout. So I think I think yours is a great question. We would think that it would come up again. Uh, since we're so used to it in Genesis, but I think I think Exodus is probably focusing on uh, a few other things than just that question of that sibling rivalry at that point. I see. I guess uh, perhaps me having a younger brother uh, really uh, helps me um, like pay closer attention to the yeah. the sibling dynamics in the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, what's your age difference? Um, six years. Okay, so that, that's a pretty good spread. So I have a I have a younger sister. Uh, I have a younger sister, and she's seven years younger than I am. And we were raised in a kind of a culturally Greek household, which is, you know, um, there's difference between men and women. And so there was always a, a distinction between us. I'm a male. She's a female. I'm seven years older than she is. So there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of rivalry between uh, between the two of us because of the distinction. And so for Gerard, what what creates kind of that violence and that uh, that rivalry is when there's a closeness and proximity. So Jacob reaching mm -hmm. out to grab Esau's heel, there's that closeness and proximity that's right there. I see. Wow. Um, another another detail that really fascinated me is um, when obviously Moses discovers his uh, Israelite heritage and his role as the the stalwart the shepherd, so to speak, of the Israelites. And one of the things that really struck out to me is that when Moses speaks, Pharaoh listens. Uh, um, and this is, um, you know, I only discovered this uh, upon like the second or third time I read the book of Exodus. And, and what is so um, interesting to me about this is that, well, you have um, the most powerful man in the world at least the known Near Eastern world at that time, he has an empire, a kingdom to run. He sees himself as a god. Um, why does he? Why does he lend his ears constantly to someone whom he regards as an inferior? You know, he's the Hebrew, so to speak, according to um, your 
the the translation Hebrew is the word that Egyptians use for the Israelites as a term of uh, any outsiders any outsiders use it for the Israelites Hebrews yeah yeah why, why listen to Moses well yes. I think in some ways if <clears throat> if you recall my definition of monotheism um, um, in the course my definition of monotheism um, it, it, for the Hebrew Bible and it's it's actually I think really helpful for lots of students is that it's not just simply, it's not that there's a God and there's only one God, because then a lot of the Hebrew Bible seems, I don't know, really odd, because then who's Moloch? Who's Baal? Mm -hmm. Who's Pharaoh? What are Pharaoh's magicians able to do? <clears throat> so I, I actually, I cheat a little bit and, and, and use a little bit of Second Temple Judaism thinking in where there would be multiple gods in this world. <clears throat> it's just they would have been seen as fallen angels, kind of these, these demons of sorts. So that means there are entities in this world that ha actually have great power. So my definition of monotheism is that our God is more powerful than your gods. It's, it's that basic and simple. So that when Moses can turn the Nile to blood and everything dies, and Pharaoh's magicians can only match what it is that Moses can do, but they cannot reverse it. They can just simply do it. Um, then Pharaoh realizes, oh, I've got a problem here. This is, he is speaking on behalf of another God who is in fact perhaps more powerful than I. I don't think Pharaoh wants to admit it. I think that's why things keep going on. I mean, Pharaoh is in a rivalry with God and Moses. And, and, I, and I try to show in the course, uh, we, we, we often see God's hand is in this, God's hand is in this, but then we also see the motif of Moses's hand. So I think you're right to associate uh, Moses's role as almost divine-like, even though he's the prophet of God. To others, he has to appear God-like. I mean, even when they're even when they're, you know, fighting, the men have to raise Moses's hands up, keep them lifted up whenever he's tired. There is some sort of, you know, uh, uh, Moses is kind of a, a conduit of this divine power, this kind of synergistic participatory relationship uh, with him. And you can even be, it just started the, the very first test is when they, when they throw the staffs down and, and, you know, Moses is, turns into a snake and, and Pharaoh's magicians can do the same thing. So it's, see, we can do it too. We, we've tapped into this sort of, uh, 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 uh uh, magical world, a manipulation of the ma natural world, which is what magic is, right? It's a manipulation of the natural world. But if you have a creator God who stands above the natural world, who stands above creation, well, you can only manipulate what's inside of it, but he controls all of it. So then what happens? I mean, I think it's a great foreshadowing. Then what happens? Well, well, Moses is an Aaron snake. Eat that snake is to say, that's a nice trick you've got there. Uh, but ours is clearly more powerful than yours. So, and this is what you see with every single one of these plagues is Pharaoh going, okay, you got me this time. Oh, please take it away. Go intercede on my behalf. Go intercede on my behalf. He's clearly stronger than I am. Um, um, and this is kind of God's, like I said, long suffering uh, uh, and, and compassion. I'll be honest. I think he wants, I think he wants um, uh, Pharaoh to, to turn and live. I think he certainly wants the Egyptians to turn and live. And there's biblical, I mean, there's uh, narrative e uh, evidence for that. Um, and so it is. And, and I think this is also probably what hardens Pharaoh's heart the most is because he is a God in this world. He knows he's a God in this world. He has magicians who do these divine sorts of things and he doesn't stand a chance. I mean, how does that feel if you're a God and you have another God who's much more powerful than you are. I mean, that's got to really spark that rivalry that's there. <laughs> yes. Now, the story of Moses, for me, has direct parallels to that of Abraham. Um, both men are called by God at the later stages of their lives. I believe Abraham was 110 when he first heard God calling him to, to move out. Um, of course, this... Moving out is also uh, the common theme for both uh, prophets, uh, Abraham to move out the Chaldees and Moses to move out Egypt. Um, so I wonder, in the book of Exodus, um, how does uh, Moses discover his Israelite heritage? 
That's a good question because the text just it doesn't make it it doesn't make it clear at all. We know that he's raised in Pharaoh's household. Just remember, Pharaoh's own daughter disobeys her father and saves the child, and 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 she and she notices, oh, this is a Hebrew child, so she knows she's disobeying um, her father. Um, and and so how does Moses know? Well, remember when he goes to Zipporah, whenever he rescues her at the well, kind of their betrothal scene. He, he chases the shepherds away. She says to her father, look, this Egyptian man uh, came and saved me. So even there, Zipporah sees him as being uh, Egyptian. Um, in, the, in the exegetical tradition, um, uh, they love to highlight um, that, that Moses would not have uh, breastfed from an Egyptian woman. Um, um, and they'll give an allegorical reading of this because he he wanted the truth, uh, and not something foreign, but the very fount of truth itself, which would be from uh, uh, from the Israelites. But let's cast aside that sort of allegorical reading here. I think what's going on, the way in which he understands that he's an Israelite, eventually, I don't, I don't, I guess he'll understand it soon enough. But it's whenever he sees. Um, uh, the Egyptian abusing the Israelites. And he says, you know, he saw his brothers being abused, but we don't really know which one of the brothers, which it is that the Israelites or the Egyptians that he sees as his brothers. And so I think what's going on there is that it's when Moses does justice, whenever he sees injustice and the abuse and he chooses the side of Israel, I think that's whenever he becomes fully part of the Israelites. I think that's the moment. So rather than kind of a an origin story for him, like what are what what's my nationalistic origin? Uh, where do I find myself with my people? I think beyond that, I think it's I think it's really an existential category. I think Moses is willing to do justice, um, and and I think in some ways. I'll be hyperbolic here for for a moment because I know it'll bother a lot of readers that I'll that I'll say this because of course God foreknows everything, but I think it's Moses's sense of justice is the reason why God chooses him is because here he is. I don't know that he knows if he's Hebrew, uh, if he's Hebrew or or Egyptian, if he's Israelite or Egyptian, but he chooses justice. He chooses the side of Israelite. And if you go back, since you connected him to Abraham. Remember in Genesis chapter 18, when God's ready to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, am I really going to keep this thing away from Abraham, whose offspring are going to keep this nation going? I'll give them generations who do what? Justice and righteousness. Justice and righteousness. So to do justice, to do righteousness, is in, is in some ways to be Israelite. And I really think that's when Moses kind of discovers I'm an Israelite because I want to do justice. Of course, in um, chapter 3, verse 14, um, my King James uh, Bible uh, tells me that God, uh, when Moses asks God uh, how should he address him by, um, God says, I am that I am. Um, but uh, in the course, you point out a different translation offered by Alter, so do tell us what that is. Yeah. So um, and let me just flip here. <clears throat> so um, uh, he says, I will be who I will be. Right. I will be who I will be. Um, and even there. And so here and on my. Uh, 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 I often like to whenever I teach the course, I like to go one step beyond even that I will be who I will be because I still think that's a sort of metaphysical or ontological category. So the I am, and by the way, I have no objections to the I am or I will be who I will be. I, they're fine, but it's still a little too metaphysical for me. It's still a little too abstract for me. So, so this is where Everett Fox comes in. Everett Fox translates it is, I will be there howsoever I will be there. So it takes that metaphysical that, that God who's out there, and he puts him inside of history, which seems to me to make perfect sense, because what they'll be reminded of repeatedly is, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. 
In other words, I've never not been with you during history. <laughs> that I will be there, howsoever I will be there, means even though you know I have the unutterable name, even though you can't see my face and live, even though I seem to be so very distant from you, please know that my name is, I will be there howsoever I will be there. In lots of the Hebrew Bible, they love to see, uh, they love to keep uh, having the, these lines. Uh, he'll say it with Jacob. He says it to Moses to begin the dialogue. He always reminds him, I will be there. So it seems to me there's something of proximity in history that's really important uh, in, in God's name uh, here. Because, you know, Moses and the Israelites, they need that assurance. And God and his condescension, and I mean this in a good way, God and his condescension gives them that assurance. Let them know that I will be there. There, not just I will be, but I will be there howsoever I will be there. Whether it's, a you know, a pillar of fire, a cloud, what the mana that, that comes down, I will be with you in history. And I think that's really important part of God's promise or his covenant to Israel, that, that no matter what it is you do, you are my people and I am your God and I will be there howsoever I will be there. So. Yes. And so this is, um, this is one of the, the things that I discovered in my, uh, you know, in my later readings of uh, Exodus. Um, this, uh, one of the examples is uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Right? And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied. Yeah. And that shows yeah. that um, God was with them even uh, when the Israelites were under Egyptian oppression. And not only that, he, he blessed them by well, yes. allowing them to be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. And that is wonderful. And, and not only that, but know that that, that language comes straight from uh, Genesis as well. That's, mm -hmm. It's very there, the act of creation with uh, uh, God creating everything. To the animals, be fruitful and multiply. To humans, be fruitful and multiply. In some ways here, I think we get the Genesis really more so than, in, uh, uh, no pun intended, more so than even in Genesis, we, we, we actually get the beginning of Israel as a nation. <laughs> and now here it is. here's a... Uh, recurring theme of Exodus that um, I think to this day still troubles me. Uh, you point out in the course that um, there, there are three, um, I guess, uh, occurrences and three ways of depiction of uh, how Pharaoh's heart is hardened. So mm -hmm. one is God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Yeah. The other is Pharaoh hardens his own heart and yes. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. So that is the English translation. So when when we read these uh, these occurrences, when when the heart of Pharaoh is hardened, what are we to think? And I guess who is to be responsible for the hardening of Pharaoh's heart? Yeah. So <clears throat> um, um, I'm I'm very glad that there are these three formula, and you stated them correctly. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. <clears throat> um, I think there's a real logic between the three. So let me just begin with the first one, um, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Had that been the only formula, um, which I don't think it could have ever been the only formula because scripture is inspired uh, by the Holy Spirit who testifies to Christ, who testifies to uh, God the Father. Um, but let's just pretend that that's the only formula. I don't. I don't know that I could follow this God. Um, um, I would follow ancient Christian exegetes, and I would follow rabbinic exegetes, who absolutely, positively would see as an 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 aberration, an unjust God. How can you harden somebody's heart only to then go and destroy that person? That seems incredibly unfair. And my apologies um, um, to to um, um, all of all of your viewers who are maybe from the Reformed tradition, um, that I don't mean this is kind of a cartoonish um, uh, 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 depiction of God in this way, shape, or form. That's not my point here. But if that's it, the the the, the ex uh, Jewish and Christian exegetes they can't wrap their head around this God who's supposed to be just. So I'm, that's why I think there are the other two formula, and I think there's a real logic. Um, uh, uh, between the three. 
um, God hardens Pharaoh's heart um, in as much as Pharaoh is bound up in the rivalry with Moses and God, trying to prove that he is in fact God himself and can outdo God. Do you know how frustrating that must be to see a mortal man in front of you or even thinking of a God in this cosmos who's more powerful than you? Can you imagine how frustrating that would be? I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, as a child, you know, if I had older kids on my block who could, you know, score on me in basketball or or wrestle me and hold me down, I was enraged. I wanted to just keep fighting more and more. There wasn't anything you could do to subdue me. I mean, you would have to kill me to make me stop. I didn't want to stop because I didn't want to be shown I was I was smaller than you. So that means what? My friends harden my heart, but I harden my own heart because guess what I could have said? I could have said, fine, you're more powerful than I am. Can you please not do this to me anymore? And it's between those two things, between the rubbing up against God, who's hardening his heart in as much as Pharaoh allows his heart to be hardened because he's prideful. He doesn't want to give up his God status. He doesn't want to admit there's a God more powerful than he and then, of course, the passive voice, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, right, between these two episodes that we see there. So, and again, you can see how Gerard comes up here, right? I mean, this is this is a, a rivalry through and a rivalry through and through. And and I know it's supposed to be of greater cosmic importance than a rivalry, but Pharaoh's just a petty man. Uh, so no, I don't see it as anything greater than just a petty uh, a petty rivalry. He may have magicians who can do things. Perhaps he can do things, but he can't do what God does. Now wrap your head around this. God created Pharaoh. And God doesn't want to destroy his creation. What is, I mean, what does scripture tell us? God, God wants sinners to repent and live, not to destroy us. And so, as you know, that's what I work through in the course is to say, I think that's the structure of the plagues is to attempt to try to get Pharaoh to just stop and turn back. Even though God, God foreknows he's not going to, of course, God foreknows he's not going to. I'm just a little, uh, not even hesitant. Uh, I'm just not comfortable with saying God willed pharaoh's heart to be hardened so that he could just go through and punish him knowing that um um he's willed him never to be able to repent does he foreknow pharaoh's not going to repent yes but but um um he he's he's trying to correct pharaoh which is very different from punishing pharaoh he's trying to correct pharaoh but we know we absolutely know that in fact what does god do in the attempt to correct pharaoh he actually corrects a lot of the Egyptians and foreigners who were there, the so-called motley crew that leaves with them, motley crew, the motley throng, uh, going back to 80s god-awful uh, 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 hair <laughs> bands. Uh, uh, the motley throng that goes with them um, are most likely the Egyptians and, and other foreigners who are there. And we also know in the Hebrew Bible itself, Bat Bithia, um, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, leaves with them in the Exodus. She's part of the genealogy that we find in Chronicles. So in fact, if God's point is to get people to stop and turn back or to stop and turn to God, which of course is his desire, then it seems to me he was successful. Unfortunately for Pharaoh, uh, he can't give up. Uh, he can't give up his prideful uh, 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 ways. Now, um, you've stated that the plates... Uh which is um you know a, a representative of uh god's uh, immense power is uh rather than an expression of god's um uh, i guess ruthlessness is an expression of his mercy and you've given the reason that um say there were egyptians who repented who saw the true god perhaps after after I don't block. even know if they repented, but they decided to follow his commandments, and that's a pretty good start to repentance. Yes, there's that, and there's Pharaoh who is unrepentant, and you've um, you've read that he is the first firstborn. So plague number ten means that all firstborn has to die. Now, I took that from the I took that from the rabbinic tradition. Oh, I see. And so it's not scripture; it's from the rabbinic tradition. And I think what they're trying to pick up on is just how hard his heart is. That whenever he comes to God during the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, and he begs for him, that God actually spares Pharaoh's life just for a moment. And by the way, 
Um, when you ask me, your very first question is, how do we square the God of the Old Testament with, with Christ? Well, there, there's a moment if we pick up, and here I'm even talking about a rabbinic tradition that would that would show you that their vision of God and his mercy looks very much like Christ. And I'm not trying to be syncretistic here. Rabbinic Judaism is very, very different from Christianity. So I'm not being syncretistic. But their vision of a merciful God who, allow, who allows Pharaoh to beg for his own life is to grant him mercy. And then even then, Pharaoh, after three days, goes, what is this that we've done? We've let them go. He still can't fully repent, right? So that's where it finally goes there with Pharaoh, um, momentarily repented, finally says to God, you're more powerful. Than... For, for Pharaoh to go to God and to plead for his life, just don't, is pretty stunning. And yet, it won't abide. He 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 has to revert from that. Uh, uh, absolutely. But that's the point. I mean, it seems to me that would be our Christian God, would it not? It seems to me that's complete. Look, when Christ goes to the woman who's taken an adultery, right? He says, you who are without the with sin, cast the first stone, right? Now, whenever she goes, he goes, I, you know, you may go. But he doesn't say, and you're fine. What does he say? Sin no more. So it's not just, hey, I'm going to cut you some slack and you can keep doing what you're doing. No, 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 no. If you're going to choose, if you're going to choose this God, then there are certain commandments you're going to have to obey. And when you disobey them, guess what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to repent. And at the very least, God has put the fear into Pharaoh so that Pharaoh momentarily repents until he just can't let it go it, it just the what would i say the monster comes back to pharaoh the the, the hardened heart comes back to pharaoh mm -hmm. now on to the ten commandments which is forms the basis of that charlton yeah. Heston movie um yeah. <laughs> uh, i believe it was um jordan pearson who says that all ten of these commandments uh are articulations of uh laws and guidelines to justice that um, are instinctively known by by people, not just of the um, Israelite tradition, but of all backgrounds in all nations. So you've uh, you've pointed out that um, alongside the Israelites, uh, a motley throng of, I guess, Egyptians join in on the Exodus. And I'm sure that uh, when they were issued these Ten Commandments, um, they understood that this these are just laws so um i'd like to hear your thoughts on it yeah so um i'll just say i'll say this i i don't know that i on on half of the 10 commandments i guess i would agree with uh uh uh, uh peterson here half of them mm -hmm. but it has to do with neighbor when it gets into the human to human relationship i agree but i i don't think i don't think it's kind of natural reasoning to to um, um, to keep specifically the Sabbath. I suppose we can abstract it and mm -hmm. say, well, we should rest from all of our work lest we overburden ourselves. Okay, I mean, I suppose that's fine. And I honestly, I don't know, uh, I don't know Jordan Peterson's teaching on, on any of this. So I, I don't want to ascribe to him anything here. But it seems to me some of these other things uh, you know, with regards to graven images, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall make no graven images of them, meaning the statues, all of that. I don't know that that's natural. In fact, I would say that's probably pretty unnatural um, mm -hmm. not to have some sort of um, um, a physical image of of the, the god that you're worshiping. I mean, so much of world religions kind of pushes back uh, against this and again i don't want to ascribe that to 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 jordan peterson there um but yes with regards to everything else with regards to shall not murder yeah good idea no adultery <laughs> yep don't steal yep don't bear false witness against your fellow man yep don't covet yep i mean uh, uh, the covet thing is of course where gerard kicks in because Gerard, he would understand this is just this, be careful of this desire. You know, you get the list, you know, don't, what, what is it? Um, 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 
uh, you shall not covet your fellow man's wife or his male slave or his slave girl or his ox or his donkey or anything that your fellow man has. It's it's about that it's about that desire. In fact, a Girardian reading would then say you could go back from the tenth commandment, work your way through it to see once you give up that that mimetic desire, that rivalry, well then what's not going to happen? If you can give up that coveting, that 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 mimeticism, and notice it's not those objects in particular. It's not the objects in particular. It's the, just the coveting period, that desiring period, whatever those things may be. If you go from there, then all of a sudden it's, well, that's easy. Why would you bear false witness against your man, uh, your fellow man? Probably because you want what he has. <laughs> uh, you want to be what he is. You want to do him some sort of harm. You shall not steal. Well, that makes it obvious. Y you understand what I'm getting at. You can read the coveting and the desiring back through this, uh, uh, the, the, the human commandment. So I see the commandments really being broken up into two sections, the commandments towards of man to God, and then the section of God to, uh, of man, uh, man to man. And I think the Sabbath law stands right in the middle there because it's both keep the Sabbath holy because God uh, uh, rested on the Sabbath, imitate uh, that God as he rested on the Sabbath. But then there are certain laws, you, there are certain commands you have to abide by to your fellow man. You, you can't force your slaves to work uh, at that time as well. So Sabbath kind of sits right in the middle for me of that, that kind of connects the divine to the human uh, there. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this, uh, I'd like to end on this note. Um, of course, uh, chapter eight, verse one uh, of Exodus, um, God spoke to Moses, go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus said the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. <clears throat> so popular renditions of the Exodus story often kept the first half, let my people go, and <clears throat> I guess spare the second half. Now, <clears throat> I think a closer reading of this commandment that God endowed to Moses revealed this, I, I suppose, this um, stark contrast between slavery under Pharaoh and, well, uh, a combination of freedom and obedience under God. Um, so how, when, when a certain, when an Israelite is presented with this choice, um, uh, why, why or how do you believe that he should choose the path of God rather than the path of Pharaoh. Uh, sure. Um, so um, it, it, I suppose it would look like this. You have to just ask, you know, what is slavery and what is freedom? Obviously, they're not free under Pharaoh. They're, they're yoked. They're being crushed. So I think any of us would choose anything other than that. That's what the Israelites are probably thinking as well until they get tested in the desert. I mean, look how quickly it happens. Did you take us out of Egypt because there weren't enough grave sites there, right? So then we just have to start asking, okay, we know what slavery is. Well, slavery is, my goodness, we have slavery to our appetites, right? Uh, very easily. There can be literal slavery where you're, you're kept under control of a ruler. Then we just have to ask, well then, okay, um, um, well, then what's freedom? Well, freedom is then getting away from that slavery. So you would say, well, aren't you a slave to God? And there's places in the text that make that, I think, pretty clear that you're to go serve this God. You used to serve Pharaoh, but now you serve this God. Well, what's the first thing God does for them whenever they're murmuring? He gives them water. They say, oh, we were going to die. And he goes, no. Uh, here you go. You'll live. Take this. Take this branch. Throw it into the bitter water, and you can, uh, you can, you can taste its sweetness. We're gonna die of hungry. No, no. Here's the manna from heaven. Eat of it. Eat of it, and that will keep you alive. Okay. And I'm gonna make a quick theological turn here, but I'm gonna finish this thought. But even then, even if they drank the water and lived, even if they ate the manna and lived. We know what's inevitable for them and what's inevitable. They're going to die. Like, so you drink the water and you live and you eat the mana and you live. And let's say you live for another 70 years. 
great. Thank you, God, for giving us this freedom. A freedom to what? To live. Fantastic. But you're still going to die. You're still, it turns out, a slave to death. You're still a slave to death. And now to bring our conversation full circle here, this is what Pascha, this is what Easter is, is about. What does Christ do for us for our Pascha, our Passover? He tramples down, he destroys that final foe of our own slavery because we're slaves to death. He tramples down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, he bestows life. There's your real freedom. And, and St. John makes this very clear. All of that, the bitter water of Marah that they taste, they take the branch and they throw it in there. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be this type of cross that's there. What is water? Even there, it says it's a bitterness of death. Ah, oh, you don't have to taste the death. Here comes the cross in the water. Now drink of it even baptismal water. But what, is the, what does the cross do? It destroys, it sweetens, <laughs> it sweetens the bitterness of death. Christ doesn't just trample down death. Christ utterly transforms death. It's what St. John says, lest that grain of wheat fall into the ground, it cannot grow, it cannot have life. So there is our, that, that for Christians, that's our ultimate Passover. That's our existential Passover. The time in the desert was beautiful. God gave him that freedom to keep living, to move, and a freedom in obeying the commandments, a freedom to, a freedom to obey the one God, of course. And they're still going to die. This is what I think Christ comes to do for that Easter, for that Passover, to trample down that last foe, to trample down that last thing that keeps us in bonds, literally in shale, uh, but to keep us in those bonds. If you look at the resurrection, a Byzantine resurrection icon, you get to see Christ standing on a cross over the mouth of, of Hades and Adam's coming out. And in some of them, they'll, he'll actually have shackles on his hand because now he's finally freed from the bonds of death. We no longer have to fear death. Death, St. Paul says, death, where is your sting? You want to talk about liberation. Why do you think all of our martyrs could go to their martyrdom with joy and sometimes singing? Because this isn't the end. This isn't the end at all. In fact, our God has transformed it. Now we get to actually be free. That is to say, free in that eternal life, to follow God freely in that way. We've, been, we've had the bonds, uh, we've had the bonds uh, broken for us there. So I think in some ways, you know, this was a, this really was a, a wonderful interview uh, for you to ask me. I, I was very appreciative that you asked me this, this time of the year, because I do think it's a perfect time. It is a time for us to meditate upon. Um, um, we were slaves, but, but through the water, through that baptism, we die with Christ. Just think about that, Chuang. When you, when you were baptized, what did you do? You were baptized into the death of Christ, into that bitter water, right? Three times we're immersed. It's, it's, it's if we're put in that grave, Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and then what do we do? We're resurrected with him. Now we're grafted on to Christ. We're grafted on through, through the Holy Spirit, grafted on to Christ, grafted on to the Father himself. There's our eternal life right there. There's, there's, the, there's the Passover for us, the passing over of death. There's our Pascha. There's, there's, our, there's our Easter. There's our freedom to live without that existential dread, to know that we get to taste of that eternal life. That's a beautiful takeaway for us to have this Passover slash Easter season. Thank you very much again, Professor Great. Justin Jackson, for joining the show.